Hmm. Oh, <laughs> hello. You've found me in my favorite pastime, perusing the selected short stories of Franz Kafka. Read them aloud? I. Well, the last time I did that, it, it was well received. I may as well. But just one. The Burrow. I have completed the construction of my burrow, and it seems to be successful. All that can be seen from outside is a big hole. That, however, really leads nowhere. If you take a few steps, you strike against natural, firm rock. I can make no boast of having contrived this ruse intentionally. It is simply the remains of one of my many abortive building attempts, but finally it seemed to me advisable to leave this one hole without filling it in. True, some ruses are so subtle that they defeat themselves. I know that better than anyone, and it is certainly a risk to draw attention by this hole to the fact that there may be something in the vicinity worth inquiring into. But you do not know me if you think I am afraid, or that I built my burrow simply out of fear. At a distance of some thousand paces from this hole lies, covered by a movable layer of moss, the real entrance to the burrow. It is secured as safely as anything in this world can be secured, yet someone could step on the moss or break through it, and then my burrow would lie open and anybody who liked, please note, however, that quite uncommon abilities would also be required, could make his way in and destroy everything for good. I know that very well, and even now that I am better off than ever before, I can scarcely pass an hour in complete tranquility, and that uh, at that one point in the dark moss I am vulnerable, and in my dreams I often see a greedy muzzle sniffing round it persistently. It will be objected that I could quite well have filled the entrance, too, with a thin layer of hard earth on top and with loose soil further down, so that it would not cost me much trouble to dig my way out again whenever I liked. But that plan is impossible. Prudence itself demands that I should have a way of leaving at a moment's notice if necessary. Prudence itself demands, as, alas, so often the element of risk in life, all this involves very laborious calculation. And the sheer pleasure of the mind in its own keenness is often the sole reason why one keeps it up. I must have a way of leaving at a moment's notice, for despite all my vigilance, may I not be attacked from some quite unexpected quarter? I live in peace in the inmost chamber of my house, and meanwhile the enemy may be burrowing his way slowly and stealthily straight towards me. I do not say that he has a better scent than I. Probably, he knows as little about me as I of him, but there are insatiable robbers who burrow blindly through the ground, and to whom the very size of my house gives the hope of hitting by chance on some of its far-flung passages. I certainly have the advantage of being in my own house, and knowing all the passages and how they run. A robber may very easily become my victim, and a succulent one too, but I am growing old. I am not as strong as many others, and my enemies are countless. It could well happen, it could well happen, that in flying from one enemy I might run into the jaws of another. Anything might happen, in any case, I must have the confident knowledge that somewhere there is an exit easy to reach and quite free, where I have to do nothing, whatever, to get out, so that I might never, heaven shield us, suddenly feel the teeth of the pursuer in my flank, while I am desperately burrowing away, even if... It is at loose, easy soil, and it is not only by external enemies that I am threatened. There are also enemies in the bowels of the earth. I have never seen them, but legend tells of them, and I firmly believe in them. They are creatures. They are creatures of the inner earth. Not even legend can describe them. Their very victims can scarcely have seen them. They come, you hear the scratching of their claws just under you in the ground, which is their element, and already you are lost. Here it is of no avail to console yourself with the thought that you are in your own house. Far rather are you in theirs. Not even my exit could save me from them. Indeed, all probability, in all probability, it would not save me in any case, but rather betray me. Yet it is a hope, and I cannot live without it. Apart from this main exit, I am also connected with the outer world 
by quite narrow, tolerably safe passages, which provide me with good fresh air to breathe. They are the work of the field mice. I have made judicious use of them, transforming them into an organic part of my burrow. They also give me the possibility of scenting things from afar and thus serve as a protection. All sorts of small fry, too, come running through them, and I devour these, so I can have a certain amount of subterranean hunting, sufficient for a modest way of life, without leaving my burrow at all. And that is naturally a great advantage. But the most beautiful thing about my burrow is the stillness. Of course, that is deceitful. At any moment it may be shattered, and then all will be over. For the time being, however, the silence is still with me. Is still with me. Is still with me, still with me, okay. For hours, I can stroll through my passages and hear nothing except the rustling of some little creature, which I immediately reduce to silence between my jaws, or the pattering of soil, which draws my attention to the need for repair. Otherwise, all is still. The fragrance of the woods floats in. The place feels both warm and cool. Sometimes I lie down and roll about in the passage with pure joy. When autumn sets in to possess a burrow like mine, and a roof over your head is a great fortune for anyone getting on in years, every hundred yards I have widened the passages into little round cells. There I can curl myself up in comfort and lie warm. There I sleep the sweet sleep of tranquility, of satisfied desire, of achieved ambition, for I possess a house. I do not know whether it is a habit that still persists from former days, or whether the perils even of this house of mine are great enough to awaken me, but invariably every now and then I start up out of profound sleep and listen, and then listen into the stillness which reigns here unchanged day and night, smile contentedly, and then sink with loosened limbs into still profounder sleep. Poor homeless wanderers in the roads and woods, creeping for warmth into a heap of leaves, or a herd of their comrades, delivered to all perils of heaven and earth! Exclamation point. I lie here in a room, secured on every side. There are no more than fifty such rooms in my burrow, and pass as much of my time as I choose between dozing and unconscious sleep. Not quite in the center of the burrow, carefully chosen to serve as a refuge in case of extreme danger from siege, if not from immediate pursuit, lies the chief cell, while all the rest of the burrow is the outcome rather of intense intellectual than of physical labor. This castle keep was fashioned by the most arduous labor of my whole body. Several times in the despair brought on by physical exhaustion, I was on the point of giving up the whole business, flung myself down panting, and cursed the burrow, dragged myself outside, and left the place lying open to all the world. I could afford to do that, for I had no longer any wish to return to it, until at last, after four hours or days, back, back I went repentantly, and when I saw that the burrow was unharmed, I could almost have raised a hymn of thanksgiving, and in silence, <laughs> and in sincere gladness of heart, started on the work anew. My labors on the castle keep were also made harder, and unnecessarily so, unnecessarily, in that the borough derived no real benefit from those labors, by the fact that just at the place where, according to my calculations, the castle keep should be, the soil was very loose and sandy, and had literally to be hammered and pounded into a firm state to serve as a wall for the beautifully vaulted chamber, but for such tasks, the only tool I possess is my forehead. So I had to run with my forehead thousands and thousands of times for whole days and nights against the ground. And I was glad when the blood came, for that was a proof that the walls were beginning to harden. And in that way, as everybody must admit, I richly paid for my castle keep. In the castle keep, I assemble my stores, everything over and above my daily wants that I capture inside the burrow, and everything I bring back with me from my hunting expeditions outside. I pile up here. The place is so spacious that food for half a year scarcely fills it. Consequently, I can divide up my stores, walk about them, walk about among them, play with them, 
enjoy their plenty and their various smells, and reckon up exactly how much they represent. That done, I can always arrange accordingly and make my calculations and hunting plans for the future, taking into account the season of the year. There are times when I'm so well provided for that in my indifference to food, I never even touched the smaller fry that scuttle about the burrow, which, however, is probably imprudent of me. My constant preoccupation with defensive measures involves a frequent alteration or modification, though within narrow limits of my views on how the building can best be organized for that end. Then it sometimes seems risky to make the castle keep the basis of defense. The ramifications of the borough present me with manifold possibilities, and it seems more in accordance with prudence to divide up my stores somewhat and put part of them in certain of the smaller rooms. Thereupon I mark off every third room, let us say, as a reserve storeroom, or every fourth room as a main, and every second as an auxiliary storeroom, and so forth. Or I ignore certain passages altogether and store no food in them, so as to throw any enemy off the scent. Or I choose quite at random a very few rooms according to their distance from the main exit. Each of these new plans involves, of course, heavy work. I have to make my calculations and then carry my stores to their new places. True, I can do that at my leisure and without any hurry, and it is not at all unpleasant to carry such good food in your jaws, to lie down and rest whenever you like, and, which is an actual pleasure, to have an, occasion, uh, have an occasional nibble. But it is not so pleasant when, as sometimes happens, you suddenly fancy starting up from your sleep that the present distribution of your stores is completely and totally wrong, capable of leading to great dangers, and must be set right at once, no matter how tired or sleepy you may be. Then I rush, then I fly, then I have no time for calculation. As I am burning to execute my perfectly new, perfectly satisfactory plan, I seize whatever my teeth hit upon to drag it or carry it away, sighing, groaning, stumbling, stumbling and nothing will content me but some radical alteration of the present state of things, which seems eminently dangerous, until little by little full wakefulness sobers me, and I can hardly understand my panic haste. <laughs> Breathe in deeply the tranquility of my house, which I myself have disturbed, return to my resting place, fall asleep at once, in new one exhaustion, and on awakening find hanging from my jaws, say, a rat, as indubitable proof of night labors, which already seem almost unreal. Then again, there are times when the storing of all my food in one place seems the best plan of all. Of what use to me could my stores in the smaller rooms be? How much could I store there in any case? And whatever I put there would block the passage and be a greater hindrance than help to me if I were pursued and had to fly. Besides, it is stupid but true that one's self-conceit suffers if one cannot see all of one's stores together, and so at one glance know how much one possesses. And in dividing up my food in those various ways might not a great deal get lost. I can't be always scouring through all my passages and cross passages so as to make sure that everything is in order. The idea of dividing up my stores is, of course, a good one, but only if uh, only if one had several rooms similar to my castle keep. Such several rooms, indeed, and who is to build them? In any case, they could not be worked into the general plan of my burrow at this late stage, but I will admit that that is a fault in my burrow. It is, I confess, too, that during the whole time I was constructing the burrow, a vague divination that I should have more such cells stirred in my mind, vaguely yet clearly enough, if I had only welcomed it, I did not yield to it. I felt too feeble for the enormous labor it would involve. More, I felt too feeble even to admit myself, admit to myself, the necessary the necessity for that labor and comforted myself as best i could with the vague hope that a building which in any other case would clearly be inadequate would in my own unique exceptional favored case suffice <laughs> presumably because providence was interested in the preservation of my forehead uh, that unique instrument so i have only one castle keep but my dark premonitions that one would not suffice have faded. However, that may be, however that may be, <laughs> I must content myself with the one big chamber. The smaller ones are simply no substitute for it, and so when this conviction has grown on me, I begin once more to haul all my stores back from them 
to the castle keep. For some time afterwards, I find a certain comfort in having all the passages and rooms free and in seeing my stores growing in the castle keep and emitting their variegated and mingled smells, each of which delights me in its own fashion and every one of which I can distinguish even at a distance as far as the very remotest passages. Then I usually enjoy periods of particular tranquility in which I change my sleeping pace by stages, always working in towards the center of the burrow, always steeping myself more profoundly in the mingled smells until at last I can no longer restrain myself and one night rush into Castle Keep, mightily fling myself upon my stores and glut myself with the best that I can seize until I am completely gorged. Happy but dangerous hours, anyone who knew how to exploit them could destroy me with ease and without any risk. Here too the absence of a second or third large storeroom works to my detriment, for it is the single huge accumulated mass of food that seduces me. I try to guard myself in various ways against this danger. The distribution of my stores in the smaller rooms is really one of these expedients, but unfortunately, like other such expedients, it leads through renunciation to still greater greed, which overruling my intelligence makes me arbitrarily alter my plans of defense to suit its ends. To regain my composure after such lapses, I make a practice of reviewing the burrow, and after the necessary improvements have been carried out, frequently leave it, though only for a short spell. At such moments, the hardship of renouncing it for a long time seems too punitive, even to myself, yet I recognize clearly the need for my occasional short excursions. It is always with a certain solemnity that I approach the exit again. During my spells of home life I avoid it, steer clear even of the outer windings of the corridor that leads to it. Besides, it is no easy job to wander about there, for I have contrived there a whole little maze of passages. It was there that I began my burrow. At a time when I had no hope of ever completing it according to my plans, I began half and play at the corner, and so my first joy in labor found riotous satisfaction there in a labyrinth a labyrinthine burrow, which at the time seemed to me the crown of all burrows, but which I judged today, perhaps with more justice, to be too much of an idle tour de force, not really worthy of the rest of the burrow, and though perhaps theoretically brilliant, here is my main entrance, I said in those days, ironically addressing my invisible enemies and seeing them all already caught and stifled in the outer labyrinth, is in reality a flimsy piece of jugglery that would hardly withstand a serious attack or the struggles of an enemy fighting for his life. Should I reconstruct this part of my burrow? I keep postponing the decision, and the labyrinth will probably remain as it is. Apart from the sheer hard work that I should have to face, the task would also be the most dangerous imaginable. When I began the burrow, I could work away at it in comparative peace of mind. The risk wasn't much greater than any other risk, but the attempt that today would be to draw the whole world's attention and gratuitously to my burrow, today the whole thing is impossible. I am almost glad of that, for I still have a certain sentiment about this first achievement of mine. And if a serious attack were attempted, what pattern of entrance at all would be likely to save me? An entrance can deceive, can lead astray, can give the attacker no end of worry, and the present one two can do that at a pinch, but a really serious attack has to be met by an instantaneous mobilization of all the resources in the burrow and all the forces of my body and soul. That, of course, is self-evident. So this entrance can very well remain where it is. The burrow has so many unavoidable defects imposed by natural causes that it can surely stand this one defect for which I am responsible and which I recognize as a defect, even if only after the event. In spite of that, however, I do not deny that this fault worries me from time to time, indeed always. If on my customary rounds I avoid this part of the burrow, the fundamental reason is because the sight of it is painful to me, because I don't want to be perpetually reminded of a defect in my house, even if that defect is only too disturbingly present in my mind. Let it continue to exist ineradicably at the entrance. I can at least refuse to look at it as long as that is possible. If I merely walk in the direction of the entrance, even though I may be separated from it by several passages and rooms, I find myself sensing an atmosphere of great danger, actually as if my hair were growing thin and in a moment might fly off 
and leave me bare and shivering, exposed to the howls of my enemies. Yes, the mere thought of that the door itself brings such feelings with it, yet it is the labyrinth leading up to it that torments me most of all. Sometimes I dream that I have reconstructed it, transformed it completely, quickly, in the night, with a giant strength, nobody having noticed, and now it is, it is uh, impregnable. The nights in which such dreams come to me are the sweetest I know. Tears of joy and deliverance still glisten on my beard when I awaken. So I must thread the tormenting complications of this labyrinth physically as well as mentally whenever I go out and am both exasperated and touched when, as sometimes happens, I lose myself for a moment in my own maze. And the work of my hands seems to be still doing its best to prove its sufficiency to me, its makers, its maker, whose final judgment has long since been passed on it. But then I find myself beneath the mossy covering, which has been left untouched for so long, for I stay for long spells in my house, that it has grown fast to the soil round it, and now only a little push with my head is needed, and I am in the upper world. For a long time I do not dare to make that little movement, and if it were not that I would have to traverse the labyrinth once more, I would certainly leave the matter for the time being and turn back again. Just think, your house is protected and self-sufficient. You live in peace, warm, well-nourished, master, sole master of all your manifold passages and rooms, and all this you are prepared. It appears not merely to give up, but actually to abandon. You nurse the confident hope, certainly, that you will regain it. Yet is it not dangerous, a far too dangerous stake that you are playing for. Can there be any reasonable grounds for such a step? No, for such acts as these, there can be no reasonable grounds. But all the same, I then cautiously raise the trap door and slip outside. Let it softly fall back again and fall and fly as fast as I can from the treacherous spot. Yet I am not really free. True, I am no longer confined by narrow passages, but rush through the open woods and feel new powers awakening in my body for which there was no room, as it were, in the burrow, not even in the castle deep, though it had been ten times as big. The food, too, is better up here. Though hunting is more difficult, success more rare, the results are more valuable from every point of view. I do not deny all this. I appreciate it and take advantage of it as fully as this. I appreciate it and take advantage of it as fully as most animals, and probably more fully, for I do not hunt like a vagrant out of mere idleness or desperation, but calmly and methodically. Also, I am not a permanently doomed to this free life. Also, I am not permanently doomed to this free life, for I know that my term is measured, that I do not have to hunt here forever, and that... Whenever I am weary of this life and wish to leave it, someone whose invitation I shall not be able to withstand will, so to speak, summon me to him, and so I can pass my time there quite without care and in complete enjoyment, or rather I could, and yet I cannot. My burrow takes up too much of my thoughts. I fled from the entrance fast enough, but soon I am back at it again. I seek out a good hiding place and keep watch on the entrance of my house, this time from outside, for whole days and nights. Call it foolish if you like, it gives me infinite pleasure and reassures me. At such times, it is as if I were not so much looking at my house as at myself sleeping, and had the joy of being in a profound slumber and simultaneously of keeping vigilant guard over myself. I am privileged, as it were, not only to dream about the specters of the night and all the helplessness and blind trust of sleep, but also at the same time to confront them in actuality with the calm judgment of the fully awake. And strangely enough, I discovered that my situation is not so bad as I had often thought and will probably think again when I return to my house. In this connection, it may be in others too, but in this one especially, these excursions of mine are truly indispensable. Carefully as I have chosen an out-of-the-way place for my door, the traffic that passes it is, nevertheless, if one takes a week's observation, very great. But so it is, no doubt, in all inhabited regions, and probably it is actually better to hazard the risks of dense traffic, whose very impetus carries it past, than to be delivered in complete solitude to the first persistently searching intruder. Here enemies are numerous, and their allies and accomplices still more numerous, but they fight one another, and while thus employed, rush past my burrow without noticing it, without noticing it. 
In all my time, I have never seen anyone investigating the actual door of my house, which is fortunate both for me and for him, for I would certainly have launched myself at his throat, forgetting everything else in my anxiety for the burrow. True, intruders come in whose neighborhood I dare not remain, in whose neighborhood I dare not remain, and from whom I have to fly as soon as I sent them in the distance. On their attitude toward the burrow, I can't really... I really can't pronounce with certainty, but it is at least a reassurance that when I presently return, I never find any of them there, and the entrance is undamaged. There have been happy periods in which I could almost assure myself that the enmity of the world towards me had ceased or been assuaged, or that the strength of the burrow had raised me above the destructive struggle of former times. The burrow has probably protected me in more ways than I thought or dared to think when I was inside it. This fancy used to have such a hold over me that sometimes I have been seized by the childish desire never to return to the burrow again, but to settle down somewhere close to the entrance, to pass my life watching the entrance, and gloat perpetually upon the reflection. And in that find my happiness, how steadfast a protection my burrow would be if I were inside it. Well, one is soon roughly awakened from childish dreams. What does this protection which I am looking at here from the outside amount to after all? Dare I estimate the danger which I run inside the burrow from? Dare I estimate the danger which I run inside the burrow from? Observations which I make when outside? Dare I estimate the danger which I run inside the burrow? from observations which I make when outside? Can my enemies, to begin with, have any proper awareness of me if I am not in my burrow? A certain awareness of me they certainly have, but not of full awareness, but not full awareness. And is not that full awareness the real definition of a state of danger? So the experiments I attempt here are only half experiments, or even less, calculated merely to assure my fears, and by giving me false reassurance, lay me open to great perils. No, I do not watch over my own sleep, as I imagined. Rather it is I who sleep, while the destroyer watches. Watches. While the destroyer watches. Perhaps he is one of those who will pass the entrance without seeming to notice it, concerned merely to ascertain, just like myself, that the door is still untouched and waits for their attack, and only pass because they know that the master of the house is out, or because they are quite aware that he is guilelessly lying on the watch in the bushes close by. And I leave my post of observation and find I have had enough of this outside life. I feel that there is nothing more than I can learn here, either now or at any time. And I long to say a last goodbye to everything up here, to go down into my burrow, never to return again. Let things take their course, and not try to retard them with my profitless vigils. But spoilt by seeing for such a long time everything that happened round the entrance, I find great difficulty in summoning the resolution to carry out the actual descent, which might easily draw anyone's attention, and without knowing what is happening behind my back and behind the door after it is fastened, I take advantage of stormy nights to get over the necessary preliminaries, preliminaries and quickly bundle in my spoil. It seems to have come off, but whether it has really come off will only be known when I myself have made the descent. It will be known, but not by me, or by me but too late. So I give up the attempt and do not make the descent. I dig an experimental burrow, naturally at a good distance from the real entrance, a burrow just as long as myself, and seal it also with a covering of moss. I creep into my hole, close it after me, wait patiently, keep vigil for long or short spells, and at various hours of the day, then fling off the moss, issue from my hole, and summarize my observations. These are extremely heterogeneous, and both good and bad, but I have never been able to discover a universal principle or an infallible method of descent. In consequence of all this, I have not yet summoned the resolution to make my actual descent, and am thrown into despair at the necessity of doing it soon. I almost screw myself to the point of deciding to emigrate to distant parts and take up my old comfortless life again, which had no security whatever, but was one indiscriminate succession of perils, yet in consequence prevented one from perceiving and fearing particular perils, as I am constantly reminded by comparing my secure burrow with ordinary life. 
Certainly such a decision would be an errant piece of folly, produced simply by living too long in senseless freedom. The borough is still mine. I have only to take a single step, and I am safe, and I tear myself free from all doubts, and by broad daylight rush to my door, quite resolved to raise it now, but I cannot. I rush past it and fling myself into a thorn bush, deliberately, as a punishment, a punishment for some sin I do not know of. Then, at the last moment, I am forced to admit to myself that I was right after all, and that it was really impossible to go down into the burrow without leaving the thing I love best, for a little while at least, at the disposal of all my enemies, on the ground, in the trees, in the air, and the danger is by no means a fanciful one, but very real. It need not be any particular enemy that is provoked to pursue me. It may very well be some chance innocent little creature, some disgusting little beast which follows me out of curiosity, and thus, without knowing it, becomes the leader of all the world against me. Nor need it be even that. It may be and that would be just as bad. Indeed, in some respects worse, it may be some one of my own kind, a connoisseur and prizer of burrows, a, a hermit, a lover of peace, but all the same a filthy scoundrel who wishes to be housed where he has not built. If he were actually to arrive now, if in his obscene lust he were discover, to discover the entrance and set about working at it, lifting the moss, if he were actually to succeed, if he were actually to wriggle his way in in my stead until only his hindquarters still showed, if all this were actually to happen, so that at last casting all prudence to the winds, I might in my blind rage leap upon him, maul him, tear the flesh from his bones, destroy him, drink his blood, and fling his corpse among the rest of my spoil. But above all, that is the main thing were at last back in my burrow once more. I would have it in my heart to greet the labyrinth itself with rapture, but first I would draw the moss covering over me, and I would want to rest, it seems to me, for all the remainder of my life. <laughs> but nobody comes, and I am left to my own resources. Perpetually obsessed by the sheer difficulty of the attempt, I lose much of my timidity. I no longer attempt even to appear to avoid the entrance, but make a hobby of prowling round it. By now it is almost as if I were the enemy spying out a suitable opportunity for successful breaking in. If I only had someone I could trust to keep watch at my post of observation, then of course I could descend in perfect peace of mind. I would make an agreement with this trusty confederate of mine that he would keep a careful note of the state of things during my descent and for quite a long time afterwards, and if he saw any sign of danger, knock on the moss covering, and if he saw nothing, do nothing. With that, a clean sweep would be made of all my fears. No residue would be left, or at most, my confidant. For would he not demand some counter service from me? Would he not at last want to see the burrow, that in itself to let anyone freely into my burrow would be exquisitely painful to me. I built it for myself, not for visitors, and I think I would refuse to admit him, not even though he alone made it, made it possible for me to get into the burrow, would I let him in. But I simply could not admit him, <laughs> for either I must let him go in first by himself, which is simply unimaginable, or we must both descend at the same time, in which case the advantage I am supposed to derive from him, that of being kept watch over, would be lost. And what trust can I really put in him? Can I trust one whom I have had under my eyes just as fully when I can't see him, and the moss covering separates us? It is comparatively easy to trust anyone if you are supervising him, or at least can supervise him, or at least can supervise him. Perhaps it is possible even to trust someone at a distance, but completely to trust someone outside the burrow? When you are inside the burrow, that is in a different world that, it seems to me, is impossible. But such considerations are not in the least necessary. The mere reflection is enough that during or after my descent, one of the countless accidents of existence might prevent my confidant from fulfilling his duty and what incalculable results might not the smallest accident of any kind, of that kind, have for me? No, if one takes it by and large, I have no right to complain that I am alone and have nobody that I can trust. 
I certainly lose nothing by that, and probably spare myself trouble. I can only trust myself and my borough. I should have thought of that before, and taken measures to meet the difficulty that worries me so much now. When I began the borough, it would at least have been partly possible. I should have so constructed the first passage that it had two entrances at a moderate distance from each other, so that after descending through the one entrance, with that slowness which is unavoidable, I might rush at once through the passage to the second entrance, slightly raise the moss covering, which would be so arranged as to make that easy, and from there keep a watch on the position for several days and nights. That would have been the only right way of doing it. True, the two entrances would double the risk, but that consideration need not delay me, for one of the entrances, serving merely as a post of observation, could be quite narrow. And with that, I lose myself in a maze of technical speculations. I begin once more to dream my dream of a completely perfect burrow, and that somewhat calms me. With closed eyes, I behold with delight perfect or almost perfect structural devices for enabling me to slip out in and unobserved slip out and in unobserved. While I lie there thinking of such things, I admire these devices very greatly, but only as a technical achievement, not as real advantages. For this freedom to slip out and in at will, what does it amount to? It is the mark of a restless nature, of inner uncertainty, disreputable desires, evil propensities that seem still worse and seem still worse when one thinks of the burrow which is there at one's hand and can flood one with peace if one only remains quite open and receptive to it. For the present, however, I am outside, I am outside it, seeking some possibility of returning, and for that the necessary te technical devices would be very desirable, but perhaps not so very desirable after all. It is not a very grave injustice to the borough to regard it in moments of nervous panic as a mere hole into which one can creep and be safe? Certainly, it is a hole, among other things, and a safe one, or should be. And when I picture myself in the midst of danger, then I insist with clenched teeth and all my will that the burrow should be nothing but a hole set apart to save me, and that it should fulfill that clearly defined function with the greatest possible efficiency, and I am ready to absolve it from every other duty. Now the truth of the matter, and one has no eye for that in times of great peril, and only by a great effort, even in times when danger is threatening, is that in reality, the borough does provide a considerable degree of security, but by no means enough, for it is one ever free from anxieties inside it. it is one ever free from anxieties inside it? These anxieties are different from ordinary ones, prouder, richer, and content, often long repressed, but in their destructive effects, they are perhaps much the same as the anxieties of the existence in the outer world. The, that existence in the outer world gives rise to. Had I constructed the borough exclusively to assure my safety, I would not have been disappointed, it is true. Nevertheless, the relation between the enormous labor involved and the actual security it would provide, at least in so far as I could feel it and profit by it, would not have been in my favor. It is extremely painful to have to admit such things to oneself, but one is forced to do it, confronted by that entrance over there, which now literally locks and bars itself against me, the builder and possessor. Yet the burrow is not a mere hole for taking refuge in, when I stand in the castle keep, surrounded by my piled-up stores, surveying the ten passages which begin there, raised and sunken passages, vertical and rounded passages, wide and narrow passages, as the general plan dictates, and all alike still and empty, ready by their various routes to conduct me to all other rooms, which are also still and empty, then all thought of mere safety is far from my mind. Then I know that here is my castle, which I have rested from the refractory soil, with tooth and claw, with pounding and hammering blows, my castle, which can never belong to anyone else, and is so essentially mine that I can calmly accept in it even my enemy's mortal stroke at the final hour, for my blood will ebb away here in my own soil and not be lost. And what but that is the meaning of the blissful hours which I pass, now peacefully slumbering, now happily keeping watch in these passages, these passages which suit me so well, where one can stretch oneself out in comfort, roll about in childish delight, lie and dream, or sink into blissful sleep. And the smaller rooms, each familiar to me, 
so familiar that in spite of their complete similarity, I can clearly distinguish one from the other with my eyes shut by the mere feel of the wall. They enclose me more peacefully and warmly than a bird is enclosed in his nest, and all, all still and empty. But if that is the case, why do I hang back? Why do I dread the thought of the intruding enemy more than the possibility of never seeing my burrow again? Well, the latter alternative is fortunately an impossibility. There is no need for me even to take the thought to know what the burrow means to me. I and the burrow belong so indissolubly to each other that in spite of all my fears, I could make myself quite comfortable out here and not even need to overcome my repugnance and open the door, I could be quite content to wait here passively, for nothing can part us for long, and somehow or other I shall quite certainly find myself in the burrow again. But on the other hand, how much time may pass before then, and how many things may happen in that time up here no less than down there, and it lies with me solely to cur curtail that interval, and to do what is necessary at once. And then, too exhausted to be any longer capable of thought, my head hanging, my legs trembling with fatigue, half asleep, feeling my way rather than walking, I approach the entrance, slowly raise the moss covering, slowly descend, leaving the door open in my distraction for a needlessly long time, and presently remember my omission and get out again to make it good, but what need was there to get out for that? All that was needed was to draw the moss covering, right, so I creep in again, and now at last draw to the moss covering, only at this state, and in this state alone, can I achieve my descent. So, at last I lie down beneath the moss on top of my blood-stained spoil, and can now enjoy my longed-for sleep. Nothing disturbs me. No one has tracked me down. Above the moss, everything seems to be quiet, and thus far, at least. But even if it all were not quiet... I question whether I could stop to keep watch now. I have changed my place. I have left the upper world, and am in my burrow, and I feel its effect at once. It is a new world, endowing me with new powers, and what I felt as fatigue up there is no longer that here. I have returned from a journey, dog-tired with my wanderings, but the sight of the old house, the thought of all the things that are waiting to be done, the necessity at least to cast a glance at all the rooms, but above all, but above all, <laughs> but above all, to make my way immediately to the castle keep. All this transforms my fatigue into ardent zeal. It is as though, it is as though, at the moment when I set foot in the burrow, I had wakened from a long and profound sleep. My first task is a very laborious one and requires all my attention. I mean, getting my spoil through the narrow and thin-walled passages of the labyrinth. I shove with all my might and the work gets done, too, but far too slowly for me. To hasten it, I drag part of my flesh supply back again and push my way over it and through it. Now I have only a portion of my spoil before me, and it is easier to make progress. But my road is so blocked by all this flesh in these narrow passages, through which it is not always easy for me to make my way when I am alone, that I could quite easily smother among my own stores. Sometimes I can only rescue myself from their pressure by eating and drinking a clear space for myself. But the work of transport is successful. I finish it in quite a reasonable time. The labyrinth is behind me. I reach an ordinary passage and breathe freely, push up push my spoil through a communication passage into a main passage expressly designed for the purpose, a passage sloping down steeply to the castle keep. What is left to be done is not really work at all. My whole load rolls itself and flows down the passage almost of itself. The castle keep at last. At last, I can dare to rest. Everything is unchanged. No great mishap seems to have occurred. The few little defects that I note at first glance can soon be repaired. First, however, I must go my long round of all the passages, but that is no hardship. That is merely to commune again with friends, as I often did in the old days, or I am not so very old yet, but my memory of many things is already quite confused, as I often did, or as I have often imagined I did. I begin with the second passage, but break off in the middle, and turn into the third passage and let it take me back again to the castle keep and now of course i have to begin at the second passage once more and so i play with my task and lengthen it out and smile to myself and congratulate myself and become quite dazed with all the work in front of me but never think of turning aside from it 
It is for your sake, ye passages and rooms, and you, castle keep above all, that I have come back, counting my own life as nothing in the balance after stupidly trembling for it for so long and postponing my return to you. What do I care for danger now that I am within you? You belong to me, I to you. We are united. What harm? What can harm us? What if my foes should be assembling even now up above there, and their muzzles be preparing to break through the moss, and with its silence and emptiness the burrow answers me, confirming my words. But now a feeling of lassitude overcomes me, and in some favorite room I curl myself up tentatively. I have not yet surveyed everything. I have not yet surveyed everything by a, by a long way. Though still resolved to examine everything to the very end, I have no intention of sleeping here. I have merely yielded to the temptation of making myself comfortable and pretending I want to sleep. I merely wish to find out if this is as good a place for sleeping if, uh, in as it, it used to be. It is, but it is a better place for sleep than for wakening. And I remember lying where I am in deep slumber. I must have slept for a long time. I was only wakened when I had reached the last light sleep which dissolves of itself, and it must have been very light, for it was an almost inaudible whistling noise that wakened me. I recognized what it was immediately. The smaller fry, whom I had allowed far too much latitude, had burrowed a new channel somewhere during my absence. This channel must have chanced to intersect an older one. The air was caught there, and that produced the whistling noise. What an indefatigably busy lot these smaller fry are, and what a nuisance their diligence can be. First, I shall have to listen at the walls of my passages and locate the place of disturbance by experimental excavations, and only then will I be able to get rid of the noise. However, this new channel may be quite welcome as a further means of ventilation, if it can be fitted into the plan of the burrow. But after this, I shall keep a much sharper eye on the small fry than I used to. I shall spare none of them, as I have a good deal of experiment, experience in investigations of this kind, the work probably will not take me long, and I can start upon it at once. There are other jobs awaiting me, it is true, but this is the most urgent. I must have silence in my passages. This noise, however, is a comparatively innocent one. I did not hear it at all when I first arrived, although it must certainly have been there. I must first feel quite at home before I could hear it. It is, so to speak, audible only to the ear of the householder. And it is not even constant, as such noises usually are. There are long pauses, obviously caused by stoppages of the current of air. I start on my investigations, but I can't find the right place to begin at. And though I cut a few trenches, I do it at random. Naturally, that has no effect. And the hard work of digging and the still harder work of filling the trenches up again and beating the earth firm is so much labor lost. I don't seem to be getting any nearer to the place where the noise is. It goes on always on the same thin note with regular pauses, now a sort of whistling, but again like a kind of piping. Now I could leave it to, my, to itself for the time being. It is very disturbing, certainly, but there can hardly be any doubt that its origin is what I took it to be at first, so it can scarcely become louder. On the contrary, such noises may quite well, though it, though until now I have never had to wait so long for that to happen, may quite well vanish of themselves in the course of time through the continued labors of these little burrowers. And apart from that, often chant itself puts one on the track of the disturbance. And apart from that, often chant itself puts one that often chants itself? that often chance itself puts one on the track of the disturbance. And apart from that, often chance itself puts one on the track of the disturbance, where systematic investigation has failed for a long time. In such ways, I comfort myself and resolve simply to continue my tour of the passages and visit the rooms, many of which I have not even seen yet since my return, and enjoy myself contemplating the castle keep now and then between times. But my anxiety will not let me and I must go on with my search. These little creatures take up much, far too much time that could be better employed. In such cases as the present, it is usually the technical problem that attracts me, for example, from the noise which my ear can distinguish in all its finest shades, so, so that it has a perfectly clear outline to me, I deduce its cause. And now 
I am on fire to discover whether my conclusion is valid, and with good reason, for as long as that is not established, I cannot feel safe, even if it were merely a matter of discovering where a grain of sand that had fallen from one of the walls had rolled to, and even a noise such as this is by no means a trifling matter, regarded from that angle, but whatever trifling but whether trifling or important, I can find nothing, no matter how hard I search, or it may be that I find too much. This had to happen just in my favorite room, I think to myself, and I walk a fair good distance away from it, almost halfway along the passage leading to the next room, but I do this merely as a joke, pretending to myself that my favorite room is not alone to blame, but that there are disturbances elsewhere as well, and with a smile on my face I begin to listen, but soon I stop smiling, for right enough the same whistling meets me here too. It is really nothing to worry about. Sometimes I think that nobody but myself would hear it. It is true. I hear it now more and more distinctly, for my ear has grown keener through practice, though in reality it is exactly the same noise wherever I may hear it, as I have convinced myself by comparing my impressions nor is it growing louder. I recognize this when I listen in the middle of the passage instead of pressing my ear against the wall. Then it is only by straining my ears, indeed by lowering my head as well, that I can more guess it than hear the merest trace of a noise now and then. But it is this very uniformity of the noise that everywhere disturbs me most, for it cannot be made to agree with my original assumption had I rightly divined the cause of the noise, then it must have issued with greatest force from some given place, which it would be my task to discover, and after that have grown fainter and fainter. But if my hypothesis does not meet the case, what can the explanation be? There still remains the possibility that there are two noises, that up to now I've been listening at good distance from the two centers, and that while its noise increases when I draw near to one of them, the total result remains approximately the same, for the ear and its consequence of the lessening volume of sound from the other center. Already I have almost fancied sometimes, when I have listened carefully, that I could distinguish, if very indistinctly, differences of tone which support this new assumption. In any case, I must extend the sphere of my investigation far further than I have done. Accordingly, I descend the passage to the castle keep, and begin to listen there. Strange, the same noise there too. Now it is a noise produced by the burrowing of some species of small fry, who have infamously exploited my absence. In any case, they have no intention of doing me harm. They are simply busied with their own work, and so long as no obstacle comes in their way, they will keep on in the direction they have taken. I know all this, yet that they should have dared to approach the very castle keep itself is incomprehensible to me, and fills me with agitation, and confuses the faculties which I need so urgently for the work before me. Here I have no wish to discover whether it is the unusual depth at which the castle keep lies, or its great extent and correspondingly powerful air suction calculated to scare the burrowing creatures away, or the mere fact that it is the castle keep that by some channel or other has penetrated to their dull minds. In any case, I have never noticed any sign of burrowing in the walls of the castle keep until now. Crowds of little beasts have come here, it is true, attracted by the powerful smells. Here I have had a constant hunting ground, but my quarry has always burrowed away through in the upper passages and come running down here somewhat fearfully but unable to withstand such a temptation but now it seems they are burrowing in all the passages if i had only carried out the best of the grand plans i thought out in my youth and early manhood or rather if i had only the strength to carry them out for there would have been no lack of will one of these favorite plans of mine was to isolate the castle keep from its surroundings, that is to say, to restrict the thickness of its walls to about my own height, and leave a free space of about the same width all around the castle keep, except for a narrow foundation, which unfortunately would have to be left to bear up the whole. I had always pictured this free space, and not without reason, as the loveliest imaginable haunt. What a joy to lie pressed against the rounded outer wall, pull oneself up, let oneself slide down again, miss one's footing and find oneself on firm earth, and play all those games literally upon the castle keep and not inside it, to avoid the castle keep, to wrest one's eyes from it, 
whenever one wanted, to postpone the joy of seeing it until later, and yet not have to do without it, but literally hold it safe between one's claws, a thing that is impossible if you have only an ordinary open entrance to it, but above all, to be able to stand guard over it, and in that way, to be so completely compensated for renouncing the actual sight of it, that if one had to choose between staying one's, staying all one's life in the castle keep or in the free space outside it, one would choose the latter, content to wander up and down there um, all one's days and keep guard over the castle keep. Then there would be no noises in the walls, no insolent burrowing up to the very keep itself. Then peace would be assured there, and I would be its guardian. Then I would not have to listen with loathing to the burrowing of the small fry, but with delight to something that I cannot hear now at all, the murmurous silence of the castle keep. But that beautiful dream is past, and I must set to work. I must set to work, almost glad that now my work has a direct connection with the castle keep, for that wings... For that wings it, certainly, as I can see more and more clearly, I need all my energies for this task, which at first seemed quite a trifling one. I listen now at the walls of the castle keep, and wherever I listen, high or low, at the roof or the floor, at the entrance or in the corners, everywhere, everywhere, I hear the same noise. And how much time, how much care must be wasted in listening to that noise with its regular pauses. One can, if one wishes, find a tiny deceitful comfort in the fact that here in castle keep, because of its vastness, one hears nothing at all, as distinguished from the passages where one stands back from the walls, simply as a rest and a means to regain my composure, I often make this experiment, listen intently, and am overjoyed when I hear nothing. But the question still remains, what can have happened? Confronted with this phenomenon, my original explanation completely falls to the ground, but I must also reject other explanations which present themselves to me. One could assume, for instance, that the noise I hear is simply that of a small fry themselves at their work, but all my experience contradicts this. I cannot suddenly begin to hear how a thing that I have never heard before, though it was always there. My sensitiveness to disturbances in the burrow has perhaps become greater with the years, yet my hearing has by no means grown keener. It is of the very nature of small fry not to be heard. Would I have tolerated them otherwise? Even at the risk of starvation, I would have exterminated them. But perhaps this idea now insinuates itself. I am concerned here with some animal unknown to me. That is possible. True, I have observed the life down here long and careful enough, but the world is full of diversity and is never wanting in painful surprises. Yet it cannot be a single animal. It must be a whole swarm that has suddenly fallen upon my domain. A huge swarm of little creatures, which, as they are audible, must be certainly bigger than the small fry, but yet cannot be very much bigger, for the sound of their labors is itself very faint. It may be, then, a swarm of unknown creatures on their wanderings who happen to be passing my way, passing by my way, who disturbed me, but will presently cease to do so. So I could really wait for them to pass, and need not put myself to the trouble of work that will needless, that will be needless in the end. Yet if these creatures are strangers, why is it that I never see any of them? I have already dug a host of trenches, hoping to catch one of them, but I can find not a single one. Then it occurs to me, that they may be quite tiny creatures, far tinier than I am, than any I am acquainted with, and that it is only the noise they make that is greater. Accordingly, I investigate the soil I have dug up. I cast the lumps into the air so that they break into quite small particles, but the noise makers are not among them. Slowly, I come to realize that by digging such small, fortuitous trenches, I achieve nothing. In doing that, I merely disfigure the walls of my burrow scratching hastily here and there, without taking time to fill up the holes again. At many places already, there are heaps of earth which block my way and my view. Still, that is only a secondary worry, for now I can neither wander about my house, nor review it, nor rest. Often already I have fallen asleep at my work in some hole or other, with one paw clutching the soil above me, from which, in a semi-stupor, I have been trying to tear a lump. I intend now to alter my methods. I shall dig a wide and carefully constructed trench in the direction of the noise and not cease from digging until, independent of all theories, I find the real cause of the noise. Then I shall eradicate it, if that is within my power. And if it is not, at least I shall know the truth. That truth will bring me either peace or despair, but whether the one or the other, it will be beyond doubt or question. This decision strengthens me. 
All that I have done till now seems to me far too hasty. In the excitement of my return, while I had not yet shaken myself free from the cares of the upper world and was not yet completely penetrated by the peace of the borough, but rather hypersensitive at having had to renounce it for such a long time, I was thrown into complete confusion of the mind, of mind by an unfamiliar noise. And what was it? A faint whistling, audible only at long intervals, a mere nothing to which I don't say that one could actually get used, for no one could get used to it, but which one could, without actually doing anything about it, at once observe for a while, that is, listen every two hours, let us say, and patiently register the results, instead of, as I had done, keeping one's ear fixed to the wall, and at every hint of noise tearing out a lump of earth, not really hoping to find anything, but simply so as to do something to give expression to one's inward agitation. All that will be changed, all that will be changed now, I hope. And then with furious shut eyes, I have to admit to myself that I hope nothing of the kind, for I am still trembling with agitation just as I was hours ago. And if my reason did not restrain me, I would probably like nothing better than to start stubbornly and defiantly digging, simply for the sake of digging, at some place or other, whether I heard anything there or not, almost like the small fry who burrow either without any object or at all, or simply because they eat the soil. My new and reasonable plan both attempts me and leaves me cold. There is nothing in it to object to. I at least know of no objection. It is bound, so far as I can see, to achieve my aim. And yet, at bottom, I do not believe in it. I believe in it so little that I do not even fear the terrors which it, its success may well bring. I do not believe even in a dreadful denouement. Indeed... <laughs> It seems to me that I have been thinking ever since the first appearance of the noise of such a methodical trench and have not begun upon it until now simply because I put no trust in it. In spite of that, I shall, of course, start on the trench. I have no other alternative, but I shall not start at once, but, po but, po <laughs> but postpone the task for a little while. If reason is to be reinstated on the throne again, it must be completely reinstated. I shall not rush blindly into my task. In any case, I shall first repair the damage that I have done to the burrow with my wild digging. That will take a good long time. But it is necessary, if the new trench is really to reach its goal, it will probably be long. And if it should lead to nothing at all, it will be endless. In any case, this task means a longish absence from the borough, though an absence by no means so painful as an absence in the upper world, for I can in interrupt my work whenever I like and pay a visit to my house. And even if I should not do that, the air of the castle keep will be wafted to me and surround me while I work. Nevertheless, it means leaving the borough and surrendering myself to an uncertain fate. And consequently, I want to leave the borough in good order behind me. It shall not be said that I, whom who am fighting for its peace, have myself destroyed that peace without reinstating it at once. So I begin by shoveling the soil back into the holes from which it was taken, a kind of work I am familiar with that I have done countless times, almost without regarding it as work, and at which particularly as regards the final pressing and smoothing down, and this is no empty boast, but the simple truth, I am unbeatable. But this time everything seems difficult. I am too distracted. Every now and then, in the middle of my work, I press my ear to the wall and listen, and without taking any notice, let the soil that I have just lifted trickle back into the passage again. The final embellishments, which demand a stricter attention, I can hardly achieve at all. Hideous protuberances, disturbing cracks remain. Not to speak of the fact that the old buoyancy simply cannot be restored again to a wall patched up in such a way. I try to comfort myself with the reflection that my present work is only temporary. When I return after peace has been restored, I shall repair everything properly. Work will be mere play to me then. Oh yes, work is mere play in fairy tales, and this comfort of mine belongs in the realm of fairy tales too. It would be far better to do the work thoroughly now, at once, far more reasonable than perpetually to interpret it to uh then perpetually to interrupt it and wander off through the passages to discover new sources of noise, which is easy enough. All that is needed to being, all that is needed being to stop at any point one likes and listen. All that is needed being to stop at any point one likes and listen. And that is not the end of my useless discovery. Sometimes I fancy that the noise has stopped, for it makes long pauses. Pauses. 
Sometimes such a faint whistling escapes one. One's own blood is pounding all too loudly in one's ears. Then two pauses come one after another, and for a while one thinks that the whistling has stopped forever. I listen no longer. I jump up. All life is transfigured. It is as if the fountains from which flows the silence of the burrow were unsealed. I refrain from verifying my discovery at once. I want to first I want first to find someone to whom, in all good faith, I can confide it, so I can rush to the castle keep. I remember. For I and everything in me has awakened to new life, that I have eaten nothing for a long time. I snatch something or other from among my store of food half buried under debris, and hurriedly begin to swallow it, while I hurry back to the place where I had made my incredible discovery. I only want to assure myself about it incidentally, perfunctorily, while I am eating. I listen, but the most perfunctory listening shows at once that I was shamefully deceived. Away there in the distance, the whistling still remains unshaken, and I spit out my food and would like to trample it underfoot and go back to my task, not caring which I take up, any place where it seems to be needed, and there are enough places like that I mechanically start on something or other, just as if the overseer had appeared, and I must make a pretense of working for his benefit. But hardly have I well begun in this fashion, when it may happen that I make a new discovery. The noise seems to have become louder, not much louder, of course. Here it is always a matter of the subtlest shades, but all the same sufficiently louder for the ear to recognize it clearly. And his growing louder is like a coming nearer, still more distinctly than you hear the increasing loudness of the noise, you can literally see the step that brings it closer to you. You leap back from the wall, you try to grasp at once all the possible consequences that this discovery will bring with it, you feel as if you had never really organized the burrow for defense against attack. You had, attended to do so, you had intended to do so, but despite all your experience of life, the danger of an attack, and consequently the need to organize the place for defense, seemed remote or rather, not remote, how could it possibly be, but infinitely less important than the need to put it in a state where one could live peacefully. And so that that consideration was given priority in everything relating to the borough. Many things in this direction might have been done without affecting the plan of the whole. Most incomprehensibly, they have been neglected. I have had a great deal of luck in all those years. Luck has spoilt me. I have had anxieties, but anxiety leads to nothing when you have luck to back you. The thing to do, really to do now, would be to go carefully over the burrow and consider every possible means of defending it. Work out a plan of defense and a corresponding plan of construction, and then start on the work at once with the vigor of youth. That is the work that would really be needed, for which I need not say it is now far too late in the day. Yet that is what would really be needed, and not the digging of a grand experimental trench whose only real result would be to deliver me hand and foot to the search for danger, and out of the foolish fear that it would will not arrive quickly enough of itself, suddenly I cannot comprehend my former plan. I can find no slightest trace of reason in what had seemed so reasonable. Once more I lay aside my work and even my listening. I have no wish to discover any further signs of the noise is growing louder. Uh, I have had enough of discoveries. I let everything slide. I would be quite content if I could only still the conflict going on within me. Once more, I let my passages lead me where they will. I come to more and more remote, remote ones that I have not yet seen since my return, and that are quite unsullied by my scratching paws, and whose silence rises up to meet me and sinks into me. I do not surrender to it. I hurry on. I do not know what I want probably simply to put off the hour. I stray so far that I find myself at the labyrinth. The idea of listening beneath the moss covering tempts me. Such distant things, distant for the moment, chain my interest. I push my way up and listen. Deep stillness. How lovely it is here. Outside there, nobody troubles about my burrow. Everybody has his own affairs, which have no connection with me. How have I managed to achieve this state of things with all my calculations. Here under the moss covering is perhaps the only place in my burrow now where I can listen for hours and hear nothing. 
a complete reversal of things in the borough. What was once the place of danger has become a place of tranquility, while the castle keep has plunged into the melee of the world and all its perils. Still worse, even here, there is no peace in reality. Here nothing has changed. Silent or vociferous, danger lies in ambush as before above the moss. But I have grown insensitive to it. My mind is far too much taken up with the whistling in my walls. Is my mind really taken up with it? It grows louder, it comes nearer, but I wriggle my way through the labyrinth and make a couch for myself up here under the moss. It is almost as if I were already leaving the house to the whistler. Content, if I can only have a little peace up here. To the whistler. Have I come, then, to a new conclusion concerning the cause of the noise? But surely the noise is caused by the channels bored by the small fry. Is it not that my con is not that my considered opinion? It seems to me that I have not retreated from it thus far. And if the noise is not caused directly by these channels, it is indirectly. And even if it should have no connection with them, whatever, one is not at liberty to make a priori assumptions, but must wait until one finds the cause or it reveals itself. One could play with hypotheses, of course, even at this stage. For instance, it is possible that there has been a water burst at some distance away, and that what seems like seems a piping or whistling to me is, in reality, a gurgling. But apart from the fact that I have no experience in that sphere, the groundwater that I found at the start, I drained away at once, and in this sandy soil it has never returned. Apart from this fact, the noise is undeniably a whistling, and simply not to be translated into a gurgling. But what avail all exhortations to be calm? My imagination will not rest. And I have actually come to believe, it is useless to deny it to myself, that the whistling is made by some beast, and moreover not by a great many small ones, but by a single great one. Many signs contradict this. The noise can be heard everywhere and always at the same strength, and moreover, uniformly, both by day and night. At first, therefore, one cannot but incline to the hypothesis of a great number of little animals. But as I must have found some of them during my digging and have found nothing, it only remains for me to assume the existence of a great beast, especially as the things which make the beast not so much impossible as merely dangerous beyond all one's powers of conception. For that reason alone, I have stuck out against this hypothesis. I, I shall cease from this self-deception. For a long time already, I have played with the idea that the beast can be heard at such a great distance because it works so furiously. It burrows as fast through the ground as another animal can walk on the open road. The ground still trembles at its burrowing when it has ceased. This reverberation and the noise of the boring itself unite into one sound at such a great distance. And I, as I hear only the last dying ebb of that sound, hear it always at the same uniform strength. It follows from this also that the beast is not making for me, since seeing that the noise never changes. More likely it has a plan in view whose purpose I cannot decipher. I merely assume that the beast, and I make no claim whatever that it knows of my existence, is encircling me. It has probably made several circles round my burrow already since I began to observe it. The nature of the noise, the piping or whistling, gives me much food for thought. When I scratch and scrape in the soil in my own fashion, the sound is quite different. I can explain the whistling only in this way, that the beast's chief means of burrowing is not its claws, which it probably employs merely as a secondary resource, but its snout or its muzzle, which, of course, apart from its enormous strength, must also be fairly sharp at the point. It probably bores its snout into the earth with one mighty push and tears out a great lump. While it is doing that, I hear nothing. Uh, that is the pause. But then it draws in the air for a new push, this indrawal of breath, which must be an earth-shaking noise, not only because of the beast's strength, but of its haste, its furious lust for work as well. This noise I hear then as faint as a faint whistling, but quite incomprehensible remains the beast's capacity to work without stopping. Perhaps the short pauses provide also the opportunity of snatching a moment's rest, but apparently the beast has never yet allowed itself a really long rest. Day and night it goes on burrowing, always with the same freshness and vigor, always thinking of its object, which must be achieved with the utmost expedition, and which it has the ability to achieve with ease. Now, I could not have foreseen such an opponent, 
but apart altogether from the beast's peculiar characteristics. What is happening now is only something which I should really have feared all the time, something against which I should have been constantly prepared, the fact that something, someone would come. By what chance can everything have flowed on so quietly and happily for such a long time? Who can have diverted my enemies from their path and forced them to make a wide detour around my property? Why have I been spared for so long, only to be delivered to such terrors now? Compared with this, what are all the petty dangers and brooding over which I have spent my life? As owner of the borough, I had hoped to be in a stronger position than my enemy, who might chance to appear. But simply by virtue of being the owner of this great, vulnerable edifice, I am obviously defenseless against any serious attack. The joy of possessing it has spoilt me. The vulnerability of the burrow has made me vulnerable. Any wound to it hurts me as I myself were it. It is precisely this that I should have foreseen. Instead of thinking only of my own defense and how perfunctorily perfunctorily and vainly I have done even that, I should have thought of the defense of the burrow. Above all, provision, provision should have been made for cutting off sections of the burrow, and as many as possible of them, from the endangered sections when they are attacked. This should have been done by means of improvised landslides, calculated to operate at a moment's notice. Moreover, these should have been so thick and have provided such an effectual barrier that the attacker would not even guess that the real burrow only began at the other side. More, these landslides should have been so devised that they not only concealed the burrow, but also entombed the attacker. Not the slightest attempt have I made to carry out such a plan. Nothing at all has been done in this direction. I have been as thoughtless as a child. I have passed my manhood's years in childish games. I have done nothing but play even with the thought of danger. I have shirked really taking thought for actual danger, and there has been no lack of warning. Nothing, of course, approaching the present situation has happened before. Nevertheless, there was an incident not unlike it when the burrower was only beginning. The main difference between that time and this is simply that the burrow was only beginning then. In those days, I was literally nothing more than a humble apprentice, uh, humble apprentice in his first year. The labyrinth was only sketched out in rough outline. I had already dug a little room, but the proportions and the execution of the walls were sadly bungled. In short, everything was so tentative that it could only be regarded as an experiment, as something which, if one lost patience some day, one could leave lying as it was without much regret. Then one day, as I lay on a heap of earth, resting from my labors, I have rested far too often from my labors all my life, suddenly I heard a noise in the distance. Being young at the time, I was less frightened than curious. I left my work to look after itself and set myself to listen. I listened and listened and had no wish to fly up to my moss covering and stretch myself out there so that I might not hear. I did listen at least. I could clearly recognize that the noise came from some kind of burrowing similar to my own. It was somewhat fainter, of course, but how much of that might be put down to the distance, one could not tell. I was intensely interested, uh, but otherwise calm and cool. Perhaps I am in somebody else's burrow, I thought to myself, and now the owner is boring his way towards me. If that assumption had proved to be correct, I would have gone away, for I have never had any desire for conquest or bloodshed and begun building somewhere else. But after all, I was still young and still without a burrow, so I could remain quite cool. Besides, the further course of the noise brought no real cause for apprehension, except that it was not easy to explain. If whoever was boring there was really making for me because he had heard me boring, then if he changed his direction, as now actually happened, it could not be told whether he did this because my pause for rest had deprived him of any definite point to make towards, or because, which was more plausible, he had himself changed his plans, but perhaps I had been deceived altogether, and he had never been actually making in my direction. At any rate, the noise grew louder for a while, as if he were drawing nearer, and being young at the time, I probably would not have been displeased to see the burrower suddenly rising from the ground, but nothing of that kind happened. 
At a certain point, the sound of boring began to weaken. It grew fainter and fainter, as if the burrower were gradually diverging from his first route, and suddenly broke off altogether, as if he had decided now to take the diametrically opposite direction and were making straight away from me into the distance. For a long time, I still went on listening for him in the silence, before I returned once more to my work. Now that warning was definite enough, that warning was definite enough, but I soon forgot it, and it had scar and it scarcely influenced my building plans. Between that day and this lie my years of maturity, but is it not as if there were no interval at all between them? I still take long rest from my labors and listen at the wall, and the burrower has changed his intention anew. He has turned back. He is returning from his journey, thinking he has given me ample time in the interval to prepare for his reception, but on my side everything is worse prepared for then, worse prepared for than it was then. The great burrow stands defenseless, and I am no longer a young apprentice, but an old architect, and the powers I still have fail me when the decisive hour comes. Yet, old as I am, it seems to me that I would gladly be still older, so old that I should never be able to rise again from my resting place under the moss, for to be honest, I cannot endure this place. I rise up and rush, as if I had filled myself up there with new anxieties instead of peace, down into the house again. What was the state of things the last time I was here? Had the whistling grown fainter? No, it had grown louder. I listen at ten places chosen at random and definitely note my own disappointment. The whistling is just the same as ever. Nothing has altered. Up there, under the moss, no change touches one. There is one at peace uplifted above time, but here every instant frets and gnaws at the listener. I go once more the long road to the castle keep. All my surroundings seem filled with agitation, seem to be looking at me, and then look away again so as not to annoy me, yet I cannot refrain, yet cannot refrain the very next moment from trying to read the saving solution from my expression. I shake my head. I have not yet found any solution, nor do I go to the castle keep in pursuance of any plan. I pass the spot where I had intended to begin the experimental trench. I look it over once more. It would have been an admirable place to begin at. The trench's course would have been in the direction where lay the majority of the tiny ventilation holes, which would have greatly lightened my labors. Perhaps I should not have had to dig very far, should not even have had to dig to the source of the noise. Perhaps if I had listened at the ventilation holes, it would have been enough. But no consideration is potent enough to animate me to this labor of digging. This trench will bring me certainty, you say? <laughs> I have reached the stage where I no longer wish to have certainty. In the castle keep, I chose, uh, choose a lovely piece of flayed red flesh and creep with it into one of the heaps of earth. There I shall have silence at least, such silence at any rate, as still can be said to exist here. I munch and nibble at the flesh. Think of the strange beast going its own road in the distance, and then again that I should enjoy my store of food as fully as possible, while I still have the chance. This last is probably the sole plan I have left that I can carry out. For the rest, I try to unriddle the beast's plans. Is it on its wanderings, or is it working on its own burrow? If it is on its wanderings, then perhaps an understanding with it might be possible. If it should really break through the burrow, I shall give it some of my store, and it will go on its way again. It will go on its way again. A fine story lying on my heap of earth. I can naturally dream of all sorts of things, even of an understanding with the beast, though I know well enough that no such thing can happen, and that at the instant, instant when we see each other, more at the moment when we merely guess at each other's presence, we shall both blindly bare our claws and teeth, neither of us a second before or after the other, both of us filled with a new and different hunger, even if we should already be gorged to bursting, and with entire justice, for who, even if he were merely on his wanderings, would not change his itinerary and his plans for the future on catching sight of the burrow? But perhaps the beast is digging in its own burrow, in which case I cannot even dream of an understanding, even if it should be such a peculiar beast as to be able to tolerate a neighbor near its burrow, it could not tolerate my burrow, it would not tolerate in any case a neighbor who could be clearly heard. 
Now, actually, the beast seems to be a great distance away. If it would only withdraw a little far farther, the noise, too, would probably disappear. Perhaps in that case, everything would be peaceful again, as in the old days. All this would then become a painful but salutary lesson, spurring me on to make the most diverse improvements on the burrow. If I have peace and the danger does not immediately threaten me, I am still quite fit for all sorts of hard work. Perhaps considering the enormous possibilities which its powers of work open before it, the beast has given up the idea of extending its burrow in my direction and is compensating itself for that in some other one. That consummation also cannot, of course, be brought about by negotiation, but only by the beast itself or by some compulsion exercised from my side, in both cases, the decisive factor will be whether the beast knows about me, and if so, what it knows. The more I reflect upon it, the more improbable does it seem to me that the beast has even heard of me. It is possible, though unimaginable, that it can have received news of me through some other channel, but it has certainly never heard of me. So long as I still knew nothing about it, it simply cannot have heard of me. It cannot have heard me, for at that time, I kept very quiet. Nothing could be more quiet than my return to the burrow. Afterwards, when I dug the experimental trenches, perhaps it could have heard me, though my style of digging makes very little noise. But if it had heard me, I must have noticed some sign of it. The beast must at least have stopped its work every now and then to listen. But all remained unchanged. That was the burrow one of the selected short stories of Franz Kafka. And good Lord, it took an hour and 25 minutes to read it. What did I get myself into? Oh, uh, was anyone here for investigations of a dog? That was crazy. So the burrow was page 256 to page 304. I think I, think I got to pause and say... I'll come back for more uh, short stories of Franz Kafka, but I need a break because, wow, the burrow, so stressful. Every moment he's like, I got something to do, and it's so important, and I should have done it already, and I feel guilty and afraid. Oh, my gosh. Fitting to read something about burrowing today as we are all uh, kept in. But does it help to think of these things? One cannot say. One can speak differently after reading Kafka. One can construct sentences uh, unexpected, unappreciated, unheard.